All right, good morning, guys. So today, I just want to talk about the uh, sample final for the pre -cal. So it's going to be a uh, few part of the final, Tuesday and Wednesday for next week. So here are some of the sample questions just want to talk about for those students that they're wondering what the final is going to be like. Okay? So while you're watching the video, you probably want to take some notes. So make sure that you guys need to know about transformation. So transformation is very important for graphing. So all the form, especially like quadratics. So we do have y equals a times the quantity of x minus h squared plus k. So a, h, and k. So we're a and k. So that's the vertex of the parabola. So the parabola, we do have two different kinds of structure, either that's facing outward or facing downward. Again, it's about the function. We're not talking about the side wave parabola. So don't need to worry about the conic section and side wave parabola. So either facing outward or downward. So if a is greater than zero, that means facing upward. a is less than zero, that means facing downward. Another thing that you need to know, basic trig identity, especially for Sokotoa. So here's one of the simple problems. So we do have a given point. So when it's 3, 4, well, actually it's a 3 over 5. And the other one is 4 fifth. And you want to find out sine of t, cosine of t, and tangent of t. Well, t is just the angle. So according to the given point, so we do have 3 over 5, comma 4 over 5, so that means the point is in quadrant 1. Okay, so this one just shows that it's adjacent over hypotenuse, and the other one is opposite over hypotenuse. So 3 over 5, and then 4 over 5. Okay, so to find out sine of t, so sine of t for this one is basically just consider 4 fifth, and then cosine of t, 3 fifth, and then tangent of t, opposite over adjacent, which is what 4 fifth. Again, it's all about using Sokotoa. So sine, opposite over hypotenuse, cosine, adjacent over hypotenuse. Tangent, opposite over adjacent. Okay. And also make sure that you understand the parent graph all the parent graph of sine, cosine, and tangent. So for the parent graph of cosine, so that one is always considered the bell curve. And then for sine, so that one is the roller coaster. And then tangent, so we do know that it's bounded right between negative pi over two, Power two. Well, this one should be a little bit over to the left. <clears throat> so it's a cubic curve. And also make sure that you know how to do the one cycle test. So the one cycle test for cosine is always from zero to two pi, and that's the same as sine. And then for tangent, negative pi over two, all the way to pi over two. But the things that for the vertical asymptote, you're not included. Okay. Another thing that I guess you need to know is about the law of sine and cosine. So make sure that you know how to apply the formula for the law of sine and cosine. And normally those type of problem, you guys can use calculator to solve. Because that's a non-special angle. So once we deal with the non-special angle, we need to use the law of sine and cosine. So now here's one of the simple problem for the law of sine. So let's say that given A equals 82, and then B is 50, and then angle A, well that's about 44 degree. So how do you set up the law of sine? So you can join the triangle first. So we do have triangle A. B and C. So angle A is 44 degree. Side length A, 82, degree, uh, 82 units. And then base B, 50. Again, figures not going to scale. So in order to find out the rest of the elements, so let's say they want to solve for capital C. 
Okay, so first thing that you want to do, you want to solve for angle B first. So sine of capital B over B, so that equals sine of capital A over A. So by plugging a number, so you do have sine of capital B over 50. So that equals sine of A, so sine of 44 over 82. And then once you cross multiply, so once you cross multiply this, so you do have 50 times sine of 44, and then divided by 82. And then you want to take the inverse of this ratio. So then you'll get angle B. So once you get angle B, you want to use the law of sine again. So you can find C. And also, uh, well, you need to find angle C first by using the triangle sum theorem. So once you get angle C, and then you want to use the law of sine again. Okay. And then for the law of cosine, so the law of cosine formula is always a squared equals b squared plus c squared minus 2bc times cosine of capital A. And also we'll do one example like this. So again, anytime they use the law of cosine, so that means you're dealing with the situations considered psi, 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 or psi, angle, psi. So let's say that we do have A equals 11, so B equals 17, and then C equals 13. Okay, so this one, let's say that you want to solve for angle A. So for angle A, so that means we started with 11 squared, and solve for A. So B squared, then that'll be 17 squared. C squared, 13 squared, minus 2 times 17 times 13 and then cosine of capital A. Again, the way to isolate that cosine of A, so we need to bring all the constants to the left-hand side. So 11 squared, which is 121. So 17 squared. So that would be considered 289. And then 13 squared, 169. And then two times 17 times 13. So we do have 28 times 13. We're just going to do it like this, 30 minus 2 times 13, which is, well, this one is 390 minus 26, so we do have 364, and then cosine of A. So for the rest of the constant, got to be careful with this. So this one is addition, and this one is a prime, subtraction with the product. So what we can do, we can add this to number first. So 9 plus 9, 18. 8 plus 6, 14 plus 1, 15. And then 2 plus 1 plus 1. Then that'll be 458. And now you want to isolate that cosine of A. So that means you want to subtract 458 first. So it's 121 minus 458. Again, you want to do the same thing on both sides. So obviously this one got canceled. So 121 minus 458. So we do have negative 337. Now, as you can see that here, those two numbers, they're pretty close. But the reason why those two numbers are pretty close because that once you divide it, it's going to be a small fractions or it's going to be small decimals, so you'll take the inverse of cosine of A. So once you divide it, so we do have 337 over 364, so that equals cosine of A. And then you want to take the inverse, cosine of inverse of 337 over 364. So this part you can either do on the TI-84, or you can do it on decimal, but there's no decimal for the final. So you can use um, the Casio or any graphing calculator device or maybe a scientific calculator. Okay. So now, let's see what else that we have. Oh, another one for trig. Solving and also using trig identities. So here's the following problems. So for solving, normally we want to isolate sine, cosine, or tangent. But things that 
it's kind of complicated, so we need to condense a little bit. So that means we need to apply the trig identity for the trig formulas. So the formulas that we have is sum indifference, double angles, half angles, power reducing. Make sure that you know what those formulas are, and also the Pythagorean identity. So now let's do the one down without using the identity. So let's say we do have something like 2 cosine of x minus 1, so that equals 0. So first thing that you want to do, you want to isolate cosine of x. And this one, you need to find all the solutions. So that means you can go around the unit circle as many times as you want. So isolate cosine of x, so f1 both sides, and then divide by 2, so we do have 1 half. And again, we're not using the restrictive range for this, so this one is, according to the instruction, it's finding all solution. So find all solution, that means, so you can go around the unit circle I mean, as many times as you want, okay? Now, any time that you go around the unit circle, that means you're going by counterclockwise, okay? Unless it's being specified, you can go by clockwise, okay? So, yeah, counterclockwise. Well, let's find out the first possibility. So, the positive ratios for cosine. So, that means it's in quadrant 1 and quadrant 4. And the given ratio is considered adjacent over hypotenuse, so it's 1 over 2. So according to this one here, that means opposite will be considered root 3, down here at negative root 3. And according to the special right triangle, so this one is considered 60, 30, 90 degree. So that means this angle here is pi over 3. So x is pi over 3. And then the fourth quadrant, that's just a reference angle. So that means in quadrant four, then that would be considered two pi minus pi, over three, which is, so that one is six pi over three, then that would be five pi over three. So the way that you want to come up with all the solution is pi over three plus two pi k. Again, the reason why two pi k, because that we want to go around the unit circle once, twice, three times, so k is any, so word k is any positive integers. And then the other solution is pretty much the same thing, so 5 pi over 3 plus 2 pi k. Again, we can go around the unit circle as many times as you want. Okay? So here's one of those problems. And now let's do the one that we need to apply the uh, identity. Okay, so here's the following. So let's say that we do have sine of, let's put it this way. So let's say we do have sine of 3x, cosine of 4x, minus cosine of 3x and then sine of 4x. So that equals zero. So how do you solve for this? So basically for this one, we can just using the sum and difference of sine. So it's, you can see that here's minus. So this one is sine of 3x minus 4x. And 3x minus 4x, which is negative x. So what I did here, I just applied the difference of sine. So sine of quantity of A minus B is the same as sine of A, cosine of B, minus cosine of B, sine of A. So the way that I did it is by going backward. So as you can see, that sine is an odd function. So sine of negative X is the same as negative sine of X. So we use the co-function property or the odd function property. And then negative basically can just cancel them out. Because once you divide by negative one, the negative one got canceled. So that means sine of x is zero. Again, this one, do we need to find all the solutions? Yes, you do. So once you find all the solutions, so this one would be considered, well, it's a unit circle. So when do you see that happen for sine of x equals zero? So normally it's starting at zero, zero radian, and 
pi. So again, if you want to go around the unit circle, so this one you can just simply add 0 plus 2 pi k, and then pi plus 2 pi k. Again, you can go around the unit circle as many times as you want. So that one is for the trig identity. Another thing that you guys need to know is about the inverses. Make sure that you know the restricted range. So you guys can watch the previous video regarding the inverses. My chapter seven, simple tests. So all the restricted range. So we're not gonna spend time to talk about on this uh, video. Then one thing I would like to talk about is the way to factor the polynomial. Okay, so the way to factor the polynomial. So a lot of people might be wondering about using P over Q, if that's not factorable, because you want to find all the zeros. But normally, first thing that you want to do, you want to factor it first. So let's do the one with the quadratic. Oh, let's, it's not quadratic, it's a, to the fourth power. It's a fourth power, four degree trinomial. Okay, so let's look at that, one of those problems, P of X. So this one is written as X to the power four minus and it's um, 16x and then plus 64. Okay? So for those you might be wondering the way to factor this. Or we can change that a little bit. Well, we'll just do it like that. So this one, once you factor, you can use the smiley face method. So it's x squared, x squared. And then 64, so this one is like negative 8, negative 8. So what we got is x squared minus 8, x squared minus 8. And a lot of you guys might be saying that, well, this one can put it in as x squared minus 8, quantity squared. Certainly, you can do it like that. But I just want to separate it out, so set equal to 0, because you want to find the zeros for the x-intercept or the root. That means x squared equals 8. And then square root both sides. So that means x is plus minus 2 root 2. Now the things that you need to watch out is this one is to the power of 2. So that means we do have a multiplicity for the same solution. So another thing that you want to stay here is the multiplicity. So multiplicity did not be 2. Now sometimes you might deal with the imaginary number. So let's say that you factor into the way by x squared plus 8. So for example, if you do have something like this, how do you solve for x? Well, this one pretty much you want to follow through the same process. But one thing that you notice, it's going to be a square root of a negative number. Now, there's no need to be afraid with the square root of a negative number. That's what that's going to be. It's going to be considered imaginary. So it's going to be plus minus 2 root 2 pi. Okay. So once you deal with that positive, the positive a, so again, it's the same kind of process, but it's going to be imaginary number. Okay, so now let's see what else that I need to cover for the rest of the simple final here. So we talk about that polynomial. And now make sure that you know what those conic sections are. So we do have three different types of conics. So one is considered a circle. So it's x minus h quantity squared plus y minus k quantity squared equals r squared. And then the second one, that's a ellipse. So it's x minus h quantity squared over a squared. And then plus y minus k quantity squared over b squared. And that equals 1. Now, as you can see, that they're pretty similar. So they all involve with h and k. And then for the hyperbola, so that one is x minus h quantity squared over a squared minus y minus k quantity squared over b squared. So this one's a plus, but the other one is hyperbola is minus. Okay, again, it's hyperbola. So now let's do one problem like this. Okay, so the way to find out to set up the equation. So let's say that you want to find the equations of an ellipse, and that satisfy the condition. So if that's ellipse, that means we're using the second one. Now let's find out what those conditions are. So here's the given condition. So let's say the major axis is 10, and the minor axis 
So that would be seven. And the foci, well, we barely talk about foci. So foci, it's on the x-axis. So anytime they see the foci, it's on the x-axis. So that means the major axis. So what this implies that the major axis, it's also right along the x-axis. So the major axis, it's also right along the x-axis. So that means this one is going to be considered an horizontal ellipse. Again, foci, that would be those two points. So that means the major axis is going to be right along on the same axis. So the way that we need to set up here, major axis, that means it's going to be the value of A. And 7, that means that would be the minor axis, which is what? The distance of B. And then the way to set it up in the center. So let's say the center. So the center is not given. So if the center is not given, that means it's at a 0, 0. It's always assuming that it's the origin. So we do have x minus 0, quantity squared, over 10 squared. And then y minus k, well k, again, part of the center. So the y value for the center, 0. And then over b squared, 7 squared. And, that equals one. and then this one you can simplify it a little bit more. So then that'll be x squared over 100. And then y squared over 49, and that equals 1. And that's the equation of the ellipse. And the rest of this, mention that you know how to solve for the exponential functions, the logarithmic functions. And also mention that you know the compound interest. And also sequences in series formula. Okay, so now we'll take a look at that. So let's say that you need to solve for the equation like 3 minus natural log of a minus x. So that equals 0. So now this one is a calculator problem, but before you use the calculator, you still need to find a way to isolate the variable. So the way to do it, subtract 3 both sides. So we got neg negative natural log of a minus x. So that equals negative 3. Negative, negative, we can cancel them out, so we get a natural log of a minus x. So that equals 3. And now it's a natural law. So that means we want to take the base e on both sides. So we do have a minus x equals e to the power of 3. And then for the rest of this, you want to isolate the variable. So that means x is a minus e to the power of 3. And for this part right here, you want to put it into the calculator and find out exactly what the value is. So now let's do the one with the logarithm, log. So the difference of natural law and LOG, so LOG we can use any number as the base. But for the natural law, the only base is what? E, the value of E, which is 2.7. So now let's do the one that would condense. So the property that you need to understand for the condensing, the logarithm, so we have this. Log base b x y is log base b x plus log base b y. So you go from left to right, that's considered expanding, but from right to left, that's condensing. So here's another one. So log base b of x over y. Try to expand it. So it's log base b of x minus log base b y. And then log base b x to r power. And that'll be coefficient. Power to coefficient. So it's r log base b x. So here's one of the simple problems. So let's say we do have log base 3, 5, plus log base 3, x. So that equals log base 3, 8, and then plus log base 3, x minus 2. So basically the left-hand side, the right-hand side, we need to condense them. So sub to product, the other side right here, it's also considered sub to product. So once you condense it, so that means we're using the first formula here. So log base 3, so 5 times x. And then the right hand side, similar, log base 3, so 8 times the quantity of x minus 2. So log base 3 is the same log base, so we can cancel them out. So what we got remain is 5x equals ax minus 16. And then just solve for x. So subtract 5x both sides, so we do have 3x, and then add 16. So we got 16 equals 3x. And then x equals 16 over 3. Another thing that you need to check is 
make sure that the quantity got to be positive. If the quantity is not being positive, that means it's an extraneous solution. So 16 over 3 minus 2, that's, that's your considered positive. 16 over 3 here, positive. So this one is considered a valid solution. Okay, so another thing that I need to know about logarithm, exponential function, is about the compound interest. So we do have two big formulas for the compound interest. One is compound interest. Periodically. And the other one is compound interest continuously. So for the compound interest, periodically, so that would be considered A of T. So that equals P, which is the initial principal. How much money that you want to put into the checking account or the saving account. So that multiplied by 1 plus R over N to the power of NT. Well, R, which is the interest rate. And then N is the compound period, whether that's compound daily, monthly, quarterly, annually. And then T is the number of years. And the other one is considered compound interest continuously, and that would be considered P e to the power of RT. So the way to pronounce it, R. Okay, so A of T equals P to the power of RT. So make sure that you know to plug in the number and then find out the final number. Or sometimes you have to solve for the year or the interest rate. Okay, so now we'll see what else that we have for the simple final. Again, sequences in series, so things that we talked about recently. So the main formula that I know for the sequences in series, we do have the arithmetic sequence, the way to find sum, and also the geometry, or the infinite geometry. So arithmetic. Okay, so let's say that we do have something like five, 10, 15, 20. So the way to find out the number of the n terms, so it's by using the formula a sub n. So that equals a sub 1 plus the quantity of n minus 1 times the common difference. So the common difference right here, so that's 5. And the first number, a sub 1, is 5. So let's say that you want to find out the 15th term. So a sub 15. So that means a sub 1, plug in the number 5 and 15 minus 1 times the common difference, 5. And then basically just evaluate it. It's all about pandas. So 14 times 5. So that would be considered 70 plus 5, so 75. So 75, that means the number of the 15th term. So let's say that you want to find the sum of the first 15 terms. So that means you need to add all those numbers together. Well, I'm trying to keep adding it, that's kind of tedious. So we need to find out the shortcut. The way to do it, it's about n over two, okay? Times a1. So the quantity of a1 plus a n. So for s of 15, so it's 15 over two. And then a sub one, which is five. And then a sub 15, so what we got here is the one that we found, 75. So we have eight, uh, 15 times 5 plus 75, which is what, 80, over 2, reduced. So it's 40, 15 times 40, so that will be considered 600. So once you combine all those numbers together, eventually it's going to be 600. Okay, so the way to find the sum for the arithmetic sequence. And now, what about for geometric? So the difference about arithmetic and geometric is that arithmetic, you want to add one number from one term to the next term, or either you subtract. And then for geometric, it's about multiplying, dividing a number from one term to the next term. So let's say we have a pattern like this. So it's like three over seven, and then 3 over 49. And also we do have 3 over, well, another big number. So let's see, multiply by 7. Three forty-three. 
So we may notice that we just multiply everything by 1 over 7 from one term to the next term. Again, this one is just a continuation. So now, for those of you might be wondering, how do I find out the number of the seven terms? So we do know that this one is considered geometric. Geometric sequence. So the way to find out the number of the seven terms, so it's the formula we're using, a sub one times common ratio to the power of n minus one. So the first number we have is three over seven. Common ratio is one over seven to the power of n minus one. Again, we want to find out the number of the seven term. So seven minus one. So we do have three over seven times one over seven to the power of six. So normally the problem like that, you have to do that on the calculator. So for the final, this number should be even smaller. Okay, so it's a non-calculated final. Okay, so just find out what that is. And now what about the sum? So we do have two different formula for the sum. So one is considered A1 times R to the power N minus one over R minus one. And the other one is considered A1 over one minus one. Now let me tell you which one that I need to apply. So let's say that the common ratio, if the common ratio is greater than one. So we're using the regular geometric sum formula. Okay, if R is greater than one, so then we're using this. But what happens if R is it's less than one, but it's greater than zero? Then we're using this one right here. Okay, A sub one over the quantity of one minus R. So for the rate uh, for the ratios, not the radius, the ratios, the common ratio is one over seven. So let's say that we want to find out the sum of the first seven terms. So that means we're using the second formula. So that's what's being said. So let's start it with the sum formula. A sub one over one minus R. So the first seven terms. So A sub one, which is what? Three over seven, it's all fractions. And then one minus common ratios, one over seven. So we got three over seven divided by six over seven. So in other words, three over seven times seven over six, reciprocal. 7, 7, cross cancel, 3 and 6, reduce, cross cancel, so we do have 1 half. So once you try to combine all these numbers together, so eventually this sum is going to be 1 half. And you may notice that this pattern here looks like the number is getting smaller and smaller, and eventually it's approaching to 0. So that's why this one is called the infinite geometric sequence. Okay, so now let's take a look at that, the, um, the rest of the content that we have for the sample final. So make sure that you now to sketch the rational functions with the complicated polynomial top and the bottom. Okay, so now we'll do one problem like this. Okay, so let's say that we do have rational function, r of x. And we do have x squared plus 4x, uh, minus 4x plus 4. And then it's all over x squared plus 6x plus 9. So this one you want to find out the x-intercept. You want to find the y-intercept. For c, you want to find va, vertical asymptote. And then for D, you want to find the horizontal asymptote. So the, that's a lot of stuff right here. And then lastly, you want to sketch the graph. So X intercept, that means you want to just set Y equals zero. Well, if Y equals zero, that means the only thing that we can set equal to zero is just a numerator. So X squared minus four X plus four equals zero. So that means X minus two factor it quantity squared equals zero. So that means two comma zero. And then for the Y intercept, that means we want to set X equals zero. So X equals zero, so all zero, zero, zero. So we left with four over nine. So zero comma four over nine. 
And then VA, the way to find VA, so that means we want to set the denominator equal to zero. Is that possible? Well, I try to factor it, so it's x plus 3 quantity squared equals 0. And that means x is negative 3, VA. And then for HA, now this one you want to compare the power. So let's say that the power at the top is less than the power down the bottom. So that means HA is always 0. But now it's the same degree top and the bottom. As you can see, the end behavior is the same degree top and the bottom. So that means HA, it's always considered the leading coefficient. So the leading coefficient is 1 over 1. So that would be 1. Okay? And then the rest of this, you want to set up the XY table, plot the point, set up the VA, HA, and then connect the dots. Okay, be correct. Okay, so now let's see what else I need to know. Make sure that you know all the identities. And also, you need to understand that the... Uh, the way to apply the formula for the R length, the area of a sector, things like those. Linear velocity, angular velocity. So again, the way to find the R length, so that's considered R times theta. And where theta, it's in radian, and R is the radius. Again, S, S stands for the R length. Another way you can do it is by using 2 pi R times M over 360. If you try to do it this way, that means M is in degree. Okay? And the area of a sector, it's 1 half times R squared times theta. Or if you do it with degree, then that would be considered pi R squared times M over 360. What else do we need to know? And the other one is consider linear velocity. So that's the arc length divided by the time. Okay, so T has the time. And V, which is the linear velocity. And then the angular velocity, W, so that's theta over T. So theta, which means it's the angle in radian, and T is the time. velocity. And also don't forget, another formula that we have is the relationship of those two formulas. So that means linear velocity is always the same as radius times w. So what is one is saying that linear velocity is always directly proportional with the constant radius to the angular velocity. And let's see anything that's missing here. And also revolution. So one thing that we noticed 2 pi is considered one rod, one rotation, or one revolution. Okay? So the way to convert that rotation per minutes, and then RPM, RPH, so make sure that you need to multiply by 2 pi. So according to the list, and looks like that's pretty much all the stuff you need to know. So make sure that you guys either fast forward or try to rewind the video, things that you're having a hard time to deal with. And make sure that you just watch the video or the previous video that I put up on the YouTube channel. So thank you for your time today.